Hello, fashion friends and family. This is Stacy from So Bromo and Elsa Fitzgerald, and we have an exciting new series that we're launching right now called Industry Advisors. And we're very fortunate to be joined by Keith Hoover. Um, and I wanted to let you guys know, this is really a mentoring session that I'm having with Keith around the work that we're doing and getting some support around some key questions that I have. But um, before we begin, I would love for Keith to tell us a little bit about yourself and your work experience and what you're interested in the work that we're doing. Well, Stacey, thanks for the opportunity to talk and to um, you know, exchange ideas. And that's really what we're doing. If, if you look at the apparel industry, you know, apparel has always been an important industry throughout time because everybody wear, wears clothes. And if when you look through the history books and paintings, one of the first thing you you're struck by is the beauty of clothing and, and fashion and style. So it's it's important. Uh, it's it, it'll, it'll always be here. Uh, there will always be real clothes in addition to um digital clothes, but everybody has to wear clothes. So I spent my time in the apparel industry. I was an art major in college. I was a fashion illustrator out of college. I drew for several local department stores. I drew for Ralph Lauren. And I spent my time throughout this transition, because if you look at the past few decades, a lot has changed in not only, well, not much has changed in fashion, but a lot has changed in the way we make clothes and the way we procure clothes from local department stores are pretty much gone. Uh, they've been nationalized and now a lot of work, a lot of sales are done e-commerce. So the whole way of experiencing fashion, it used to be entertainment. Bloomingdale's slogan back in the nineties was, it's like no other store in the world because it was an experience to go into a Bloomingdale store, not just because you needed to buy a shirt, but because you were surrounded by this, this whole aesthetic thing. So the entertainment that that customer experience is gone, but now it's they're trying to incorporate it back online. So whether it's through e-commerce or through the metaverse or whatever, the nature of entertainment is changing, but um, clothes are still clothes. So I, I've seen the the way the products have been developed. From uh, I've worked for brands like Ralph Lauren, Target, J.C. Penney, Lands End, Under Armour. Um, they all think they're they're unique. They're not. I mean, clothes are, you're basically, it's, it's yarn spun into fabric, fabric cut and sewn together into pieces to make a garment. And depending on your, your budget and how much complexity or simplicity you want in the style, it's still two arms, a neck, you know, up buttons down in front, that kind of stuff. So, so it's, the brands differ in how they market, but there is this common thread as it were on how garments are made. And I think that's what our focus is. How do you make clothes? How do you make great clothes? And who are the people involved in this process from design through actual construction and assembly of the parts? Oh, I love it. I love hearing about like the different histories of people's backgrounds and how it translates into their work. And you were like started as an artist, which I think is really remarkable because not everyone does. Sometimes they come in from the product development lens or a technical designer. So that's really exciting. Um, so my first question is um, wearable technology and process innovations are leading the discussion for the fashion industry. But what will happen to heritage skill sets and foundational knowledge of the needle trades? the technical elements that historically were passed down from the master to the apprentice. So what happens when we're focusing more on the wearables side and not necessarily the transfer of knowledge? Well, I think, I mean, that's an important question because it, the question, the whole concept of wearable or smart textiles or this whole kind of thing, it presumes that we know how to make dumb textiles, that we know how to, the fundamentals. And in your question about what happens to the, the legacy skill sets, well, that's the problem. We don't, we're, we're losing the legacy skill sets. And so wearables is in, in the apparel, I think it's a pipe dream. I think that if you look at the, the apparel sales as a whole, um, <clears throat> the, the wearable uh, products accounts for like 0.005% of all sales globally. And wearables, is, it's technology driven, so it requires a lot of investment in, 
in new technology and in processes kind of stuff. And there's a very small rate of return. So I think it's, I, I think wearables is a distraction. I, I would much rather focus on um, beautiful garments than functional garments. As far as if you, if I have to add technology, if I have to add electronics to a garment, then, you know, what am I really doing? I mean, it's it, with, there's enough issues with sustainability and, and get and getting rid of fabrics that are no longer in use. What happens to all the the other elements that you add to it? So um, <clears throat> for the military, it makes perfect sense because soldiers um, have a different end use than people walking down the street. So I think wearable smart textiles make sense from a, a Department of Defense point of view, but not for um, the private sector. So I so I flip I flip the question around. What do we do to um, to support, to document, to encourage, to expand on those basic skill sets um, of making garments and making great garments? Well, you just led me to my next question, <laughs> which is, um, what incentive is there for <clears throat> anyone to consider getting into the needle trades as a sewing machine operator in the U.S.? If the mean wage is between $16 to $21 an hour, the garment industry has remained as an undervalued sector, which has left individuals trading industries for better opportunities. There's none. <laughs> but, but, well, but, but look at it. Um, of, of, the, of the $350 billion of clothing sold in the U.S. every year, 2.5% is made in the U.S., and most of that's made for the military because it has to be made because by legislation. And, and then there's the whole, there's a, um, there's a department of the, of the government called Unicor that um, is basically prison industries where, where prisoners are paid 50 cents an hour to make clothing for some government contracts. If that were, if that were, if a, um, if a brand were caught doing that in China, it'd be, it'd be in the Wall Street Journal about how terrible they are. But the, the fact of the matter is, uh, in an effort to trade to train prisoners with skills, th that program was was set up. So <clears throat> the, the the our industry in the U.S. because it's an, in it's an industry of the past, and because it's kind of a, a you know we we basically said we don't need the apparel industry. We're going to send it overseas to developing countries we have undervalued the importance of apparel. So it's not surprising that, there's, that it's not um, paying very much. There's, there's a low demand and there's a waning interest. Um, there, is, there, there was a time when, um, when, when sewing was considered a, a valued domestic skill that um, parents taught their children that they taught in schools, not so much anymore. So, uh, so every every facet of the of the apparel industry has kind of been um, dirtied. So that here we are in 2023, where you're going to top out at 20, 23 bucks an hour, um, perhaps without benefits. So, um, I think that's that. It's not where we should be. It's not where we were in the past, and it's not where we will be in the future. But I think it's kind of an incentive to rethink um, the apparel industry. Um, we're not just, it's not, it's called sewn products. Perhaps it's assembled product would be a, a different way of, of, of um, putting it. In other industries, um, if you're an automotive, you're assembling cars, um, your union wages are are, are very um, generous and there's benefits and there's, it's been considered a, a great legacy industry for people, you know, for their um, sons and daughters get to go into. So I think we, is, we just have to rethink what the apparel industry is. We're assembling products. Everybody's going to always have clothes. Uh, so it's the challenge. It's an entrepreneurial challenge. It's not a workforce development challenge. It's a rethinking how we approach apparel. Well, that's why the fashion entrepreneurs are here to rethink it. <laughs> All of you out there that are listening, <laughs> you've got to know what's going on in order to think of new solutions or a new lens as to how to tackle these things. Um, so my third question is, 
What happens when the master craftspeople of the needle trades pass and the knowledge is left behind as an oral history never put into practice? Does it become extinct? Um, yes, and that's a real threat. Um, we've I've seen it in um, I've seen it in the um, the textile industry where you know whether it was knitters and dyers and weavers um, in different parts of the country where those industries closed shop. And those people went, they, they didn't, they didn't move, some of them over, so moved overseas, but most of them just, they switched industries. They went to work at Lowe's or something. And so we lost a whole um, generation's worth of knowledge. Now, <clears throat> perhaps some would make the case that you have to let old things die, uh, that you have to wander the wilderness for 40 years to get rid of old thinking. But I don't think that's the case here. I think there's a real threat um, to our industry. Not only are we losing the skilled um, craftsmen and artisans, but we're losing an understanding of how things are made. Um, we have apparel brands in, in New York and on the West Coast, whatever, um, who, you know, people, super creative people, but people that have never been in a garment factory who don't understand the, the process of how garments are made. We have sourcing departments for brands making design decisions to cut costs out of product. And we don't have designers pushing back saying, no, I can make that garment uh, beautiful and still do it at cost. So not only are we losing the, 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 the artisans, the generations of artisans, but we're losing the mindset of how to make fashion. Fashion isn't just a, a nice 3D image that is generated in software. The only reason you design a garment is to make a garment. And so if, if you don't understand the, the process of, of construction, of how fabrics work together, of how seams work, of drape, all the different aspects of aesthetics and functional properties, then we're gonna be stuck with people wearing yoga pants and, and gym shorts, which is not a pretty picture. So, so we, need to, we, we need to maintain this knowledge so that the industry can, can progress. That is always so interesting just to be able to highlight these things that I don't think people notice. It wasn't until I worked in the garment factory that I saw the hand on sewing the hands-on machine time was a thing and and how limited you'd want to make that so the cheaper you create a garment and so although it's made in the U.S. it took it, it was all many of the construction elements did not exist because it was designed that way um, and that leads me to my next question which is does the historic needle trades process remain valued only by the consumption of the product is there another utilization beyond exchange for the product well, yes, and I think I think we have we have um, reduced we have reduced our industry to cost, 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 cost. That's the reason why we went overseas, not only for cost but for regulatory compliance. So we didn't have to put up with all the things that a a, a well regulated democracy requires, and that's catching up with this. Uh, countries overseas have have flourished by, by virtue of them becoming um, manufacturing companies and countries. And they, they also, as you know, apparel is kind of an entry level industry. And, and once it catches on, then you go to electronics or automotive. And so, so I mean, we're not the only ones that, that don't like making clothes um, the way they've always been made. But um, I think there is value in in just the, the function of making, not making for sale, but making. Um, <clears throat> people are foodies because they like to eat and because they like to have be hands-on in preparing food. Yeah, they could go to McDonald's, but it's not the same. So I think there has to, we have to return to a domestic appreciation of making clothes. And it's it's kind of, we're, we started, we had this cool software like Clo or Browseware where we can create these, these 3D garments and we can, we can actually digitize ourselves and we become the avatar and then we can custom make clothes for us. 
Now, if you if you listen to social media, then that becomes a metaverse. <clears throat> but what if what if you basically output those files and made your own clothes? And you can, because literally you could. You could if I'm using browser or clo, I can create the pattern pieces and and drape them around me and create a cool cool garment that's customized for me. I could send a, the file to a, a to Staples, have it printed out in a plotter. They have my, my pattern pieces, and I could sell it for myself. So I think um, whether it's in um, education of our kids, so um, they 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 learn to appreciate the the craft and art of sewing, um, whether it's um, caring more about understanding that that people do respond to how people dress, like it or not. Um, and clothing are is a personal expression. So I think that there's, why not harness some of this technology to, to enable people to value clothing and apparel for fashion, not just for a commercial um, exchange. I'd like to see the garments that you've made from this. <laughs> <laughs> Um, my last question is a similar one, but it's more refer referencing um, high-end fashion. So those finer needlework methods, you know, things you'd see in haute couture and these garments that are made for a very small percentage of the population, you know, less than 200 people around the world, um, those fine um, needlework methods, um, what happens when those are not utilized and then they're just left to garments that you're going to see in museums that are left sort of decaying in time due to age and, you know, lack of uh, funds for conservation? Uh, what what happens to not just the master crafts person, but what happens to that skill uh, when, when we when we move beyond um, the demand? Well, I think um, I think that that we need to preserve the skill sets, if nothing more, than to understand the thought process that that went into developing those skill sets. Um, we're the story of history is the development of technology and technology is a tool that allows you to do something faster, something good or something bad. I mean, it's usually bad, but no, but technology is, it allows you to do something faster. So I don't expect that the sewing industry in, in 50 years will still be using the same methods um, that we're using today. Um, Per, they'll they'll have adopted technology to allow you to do those methods faster. Uh, we talked before about embroidery. Um, embroidery can be done by hand and it can be done very beautifully, but it can also be done by machine uh, with very sophisticated results as well. And so technology has allowed an aesthetic component of fashion to be adopted to the masses with, without the cost burden. So I think... Um, but but here again, technology allows you to do something faster. You have to know what to do faster. And if if we lose the the um, the artisans who are the highly skilled um, people now, then we lose that that what and that how. We have to we have to retain. We have to understand how stuff is made so that we can um, work out processes. There's there's a growing demand. Um, we call it local for local, but to buy locally, um, you know, you know, there was the old um, adage a long time ago, think globally, act locally. Well, how do you act locally when it comes to apparel if everything is made halfway around the world? Well, I think there's there is a growing concern about the proliferation of excess goods, be it fast fashion, overproduction, whatever. But there is a, a desire for people to to want to buy locally, and, and and for that to happen, there has to be um, there has to be understanding of the industry. There has to be a commercially viable way to make stuff locally. Um, if I want to get a custom shirt done, I go to a tailor. I mean that the tailors have been around for a long time, so there are ways to get customized stuff. But between lot size of one and small runs. That's the sweet spot. How do you how do you set up a company to make limited runs of, of of garments? And that's where technology can come in. There's a lot of work being done by companies around the world on this, and we're not the only ones in the U.S. concerned about this. Actually, there are major programs in China where they're trying to develop this. 
but it, it it's these these things are going to happen because of the demand for um, for a new way of doing things, and that that has to it's back to hands on. We can't make. I mean, stuff doesn't just appear out of a replicator like it's Star Trek. I mean, there's actually has to be. If if you're willing to make your dinner from fresh vegetables and locally grown products, then why not the same for apparel? And if 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 you maybe if you can't make it yourself, why wouldn't you want to buy it from a a local um, business? So I think there's there's this change. <clears throat> um, globalization moved everything out. And now I think there's this kind of local for local returning home that's kind of, okay, we, maybe we went too far. Let's bring these skills back. That was all my questions. And I know when we chatted about this earlier, we, we were like thinking, oh, is this depressing? <laughs> <laughs> this is the reality. And so this is our job. Uh, I guess I always say I'm like the next generation of entrepreneurs to reimagine those elements of industry that are beautiful and that are magical. And, and I think it's up to each individual entrepreneur to just define and distinguish that lane. Um, so there's two parts to our work. We have, um, we took over an abandoned garment factory, turned it to a school, which is now incubated into a bunch of different um, entrepreneurs in the needle trades um, doing their own work, but collectively tackling this, th this kind of reimagining of the work. Um, I do see that the entrepreneurs are important to the mix because they are typically doing like small batch. They don't really have a choice to scale and go offshore as much. And so um, we work with impact driven factories entrepreneurs who are committed to staying in the U.S., um, in particular in Maryland at the moment. Um, but we have to continue to support them and grow and, and kind of acknowledge that these things are reality. The other side to our work is around the Fashion Heritage and Needle Trades Foundation, where the, we're trying to catch up as well to the, the death. It, the reality is the, the, the master craft people have a 10-year window of time, if not less, between the moment that they know the skill, they're old enough to know it, but young enough to share it. So trying to capture that knowledge in video form so that it's documented and archived for use um, via utilized video content in the future. So those are two sides of the coin where we're flipping it on the entrepreneur and saying, hey, you are accountable to this decision. You could be a part of reimagining this work by choosing to make here, but also on the other side, having that skill set that is being documented that hopefully can survive this transformation of industry that where eventually they might meet in the middle. So I hope and am excited to continue this work and so thankful to Keith for taking some time time and being one of our advisors we are so lucky well i think it's i think you make a good point as an entrepreneur you have to frame the problem you can't you just can't assume that the what you think of the problem is is the definition you need to get out there you need to talk to folks you need to look around and you know ignore ignore the conventional wisdom um if you know, if i listen to nothing but social media i think that Sustainability and circularity are the two biggest concerns in the world. Well, they're certainly important, but there are problems that we can that we can address today that have everything to do with with our own um, happiness, with our economy, with our country, with our community, and with the future as well. So, um, you know, there are things that we can do uh, without boiling the ocean. There are things that we can do talk to brands, get input, start your own uh, business, but understand what you're getting into. Um, if that's the first and the biggest point, I think. Well, I would consider that a wrap. Thank you everyone for joining us for this evening or this day, depending on where you are in the world and what time you're watching this. And we look forward to seeing you next time. Bye. Bye-bye.